Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we hope you uh, had a good opportunity to have some chats and have some lunch and uh, discuss some of the some of the morning's uh, deliberations. We heard from a really excellent cross section of speakers representing different parts of the uh, Nigerian government, representing civil society and the activist community, uh, providing us with both analytical scope and perspective, uh, a good deal of insight into the current situation and how it's assessed in various uh, quarters, uh, as well as, as different perspectives on what is occurring now and the challenges looking ahead. And so uh, it's very fitting and uh, appropriate, and indeed quite welcome, that we're joined by Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, uh, Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield. We're very pleased and honored to have you, um, particularly as she reminds me uh, that uh, we're looking toward, in just about three weeks' time, uh, a much larger gathering of uh, official and unofficial uh, African visitors in Washington. And so the fact that she could break away uh, even briefly to speak to us today at this important series of events uh, is very welcome. Uh, I won't uh, take up much time with uh, introductions except to note that uh, Secretary Thomas Greenfield uh, has been a member of the Career Foreign Service, an ambassador uh, in Liberia, uh, a dep principal deputy assistant secretary of state in the Bureau of African Affairs uh, in the uh, mid-2000s, and uh, also she's been a, a, a PDAS um, in the Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Migration. So she has long and deep experience and insight into the challenges of uh, Africa as a continent, uh, and Nigeria as a country. She's been posted to Nigeria in the past, as well as Gambia, Kenya, Liberia, uh, and other countries, and so brings a long legacy or a long uh, train of experience to her uh, remarks and her perspective today. Uh, without any further delay, but permitting her a couple of minutes to enjoy her coffee, which uh, I can only concur is essential, um, we'll uh, invite her to the podium, and then we'll have a few minutes for Q&A. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, I don't know whether it's a good thing to speak to a group after lunch when you're satisfied and you've had a morning of speeches, and so you feel as if you can close your eyes a bit to a boring speaker or to have spoken to you before lunch when you were hungry. Uh, but I'll do my best to, uh, to keep you all interested uh, so that you do stay awake. I'll try to make this as brief as possible so that, um, uh, so that I leave time for, uh, for Q's and A's. Again, let me uh, say how delighted I am to be here today. I think this is an extraordinarily important Event. It's a timely uh, event as we uh, approach uh, the uh, election in uh, Nigeria, uh, as well as a number of elections across the continent of Africa uh, as, we move into, uh, as we move into 2015. Uh, let me uh, start by thanking CSIS, uh, particularly Jennifer uh, and uh, Richard Downey for inviting me to speak today, but more importantly, for hosting, uh, hosting this event at, at this time. I would like to also thank our distinguished guests for making the long journey from Nigeria. Uh, your expertise and wisdom are, are critical uh, as Nigeria prepares for these important elections, and I wanna thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. I think we can all agree that the impressive turnout for this event is indicative of the strong interest in Nigeria's upcoming election, but also is indicative of the importance of these election, elections, not just for Nigeria, but for the entire continent. As the most populous country in Africa, and as a continental power, Nigerian politics have a tremendous influence on the continent. The choices uh, Nigerians make in this critical election will have great ramifications for the future of Nigeria, and for the future of the continent, but more importantly, uh, for the people of Nigeria. 
The United States stands as a partner and a friend to Nigeria and its people. We're ready to do everything within our power to assist in ensuring that the vote is credible and that the vote is peace peaceful. But credibility does not start uh, just on election day. Uh, credibility starts months before the election, and I know that's why you are all here today and why we're here today having this discussion. Through the U.S. Agency for International Development, we're working to enhance the capacity of the Independent National Election Commission. We are engaging with a wide spectrum of Nigerian leaders from the political class and civil society. We're communicating the importance that we place on this election and calling for the utmost efforts to ensure transparency and peace in the contest of the election. This includes ensuring that all voters are enfranchised, including those living in the three northeastern states currently under a state of emergency. To complete a successful election, a nation must tackle many challenges. Few of these challenges are more important than security, and I'm glad that this session has focused attention on this important topic. Security issues matters during all phases of the election. During the campaign, violent words and deeds can undermine the confidence of ordinary voters in the electoral process. Intimidation and thuggery can make candidates and citizens afraid to engage. And campaign violence can tarnish an election's image as, uh, before the even before the first vote is ever cast. In the case of Nigeria, developing and executing an electoral security strategy will be critical to ensuring that elections can take place in regions of the country facing the Boko Haram attacks and threats. During the vote itself, insecurity can facilitate manipulation and tampering. If uh, might makes right, the people's will will be overturned, and we don't want to see that happen. During the post-election phase, violence can tarnish even the best-run election. When results are greeted with riots, the legitimacy of the process can be called into question at home as well as abroad. Last September, I attended the U.S.-Nigeria Bilateral Commission in Abuja. When I met with the INEC chairman, Professor Jega, at the time, he told me that he sought not just to make the 2015 elections better, than 2011, but he also wanted to meet international standards and deliver the election that Niger the Nigerian people deserve. In fact, he indicated that he wanted this to be the best election that Nigerians have had. We hope that his promise will come true, both for the sake of Nigeria's democracy and its stability, but that uh, for, for that to happen, Nigerians must be uh, willing to do everything in their power to ensure that the vote proceeds not just credibly, but also peacefully. And you'll notice that I use the word peace, peacefully almost in every sentence here, because these elections must be peaceful if they are to happen uh, at all. That imperative places a heavy burden and a responsibility on the Nigerian security services. They will need to undertake a critical task. They have to protect civilians and protect the process, refraining from any intimidation or tampering to enable citizens to be the decision makers about who governs them. I urge the delegates here as civil society representatives, uh, as former government officials, to impress upon the Nigerian government writ large and the security services particularly the importance of this responsibility. I urge you to hold them accountable for their performance. The United States stands ready to provide training, to provide advice to the security services in fulfilling their responsibilities and to ensure that they fulfill those responsibilities with restraint and impartiality. Mitigating violence is also the responsibility of politicians because politicians are the ones that the violence is for. And no politician should want to win an election because the people who support them fought the hardest, or killed the most people, or were more violent than the other party. They want to, they should want to win an election because they were the candidate of choice. People voted for them, and those who didn't vote for them accepted the choice. In my travels to Nigeria and my meetings with Nigerian leaders, I have urged politicians of all parties 
to avoid incendiary rhetoric and to reject intimidation and manipulation as campaign tactics. This election is too important for that. No office holder should use the power of incumbency to intimidate challengers, and no challenger should threaten or incite violence to undermine the democratic process. I urge you to demand that politician, politicians meet the high standards of patriotic and honorable campaigning based on the issues that matters to citizens. It's not about them, it's about the issues. And that's a point that we have to continue to make and voters need to understand in the education process. It's not about who's running, it's about where they stand on the issues. And too many times in African politics, the issues are put in second place to the candidate, to the personality, to the person. The issues are what should matter to the voters. Holding a safe election is also the responsibility of ordinary citizens. Words and signals from the top can trigger violence, but violence can also emerge from the anger that exists among the jo jobless, the disenfranchised, and the marginalized. Many ordinary people in Nigeria have reasons to be frustrated or angry, uh, especially uh, many of those who have experienced the recent violence that Boko Haram has carried out in the north in Jos, as well as in Abuja. And I just heard as I was coming in uh, uh, just now that their, uh, Boko Haram has taken responsibility for the attack that took place in, in Lagos. Nigeria's economy has risen to become the largest in Africa, but over 60% of Nigerians live at the bottom of the economic ladder, subsisting on less than a dollar each day. And I'm not telling you anything that you don't already know. You see the people begging on the streets in, in Nigeria. I was in the north recently. I saw the large number of children who were begging on the streets. And as these Nigerians struggle to find work, as they struggle to feed their families, it is understandable that they question why uh, corruption goes unpunished and the power for go unchecked. We should all work to urge Nigerians, particularly youth, to channel their grievances uh, toward making uh, their community and their country better. They should use their power to build, not to destroy. Every time I've been in Nigeria, I've been impressed by the vibrancy of civil society, the uh, vibrancy of uh, journalism, uh, particularly impressed by the religious community, the film community, as well as other modes of expression in Nigeria. Nigerians know better how to express themselves uh, than any group of people I know anywhere in the world. This kind of vibrancy should be used to encourage and support transparent and peaceful elections. Urging these channels, youth can and must make a positive contribution to the country's politics, not a negative one. 2015 is an opportunity for them to do this, and delegates who are here today as leaders within Nigeria's civil society, you can play a strong part in encouraging young people to constructively engage in the electoral process, using it as a, a window of opportunity to nonviolently push for more responsive governance on the issues that matter to them. Along these lines, we're supporting efforts to channel the energies of Nigerian youth in a positive direction as we do in countries all over the world. In Nigeria, our Conflict and Stabilization Operations Bureau supports the efforts of the Niger Delta Legacy Board, some of whom are here today. Uh, where are you here in the room? Oh, good. I know you. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Uh, so you should work uh, as they have to harness media, engage civil society to pr promote the message that communities, and in particular youth, can make nonviolent change. Here in the United States last month, we saw the kickoff of the Washington Fellowship Program under President Obama's Young African Leaders Initiative. We have 500 of the most amazing young people I have met from Africa here in the United States, and they're just a drop in the bucket of the amazing. 50,000 applied for the program. Uh, of those 50,000, uh, only 500 were selected. There were 15,000 applications from Nigeria alone, showing, thank you, Ambassador, showing how 
uh, it shows how important youth are, but it shows how much they need and how much they want to be part of the process. Uh, I am looking forward to welcoming, welcoming these young people to Washington from the 28th through the 30th of July when they will uh, be hosted by the president for a town hall meeting. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, Nigeria is one of the largest contributors and these young people are the future leaders of Nigeria. And when we're talking about political leadership, we're, when we're talking about leadership, we're not just talking about political leadership, but we're talking about leadership across the board. We're talking about leadership in the private sector. We're talking about civil society. We're talking about leading in communities. And I hope that these Nigerian alumni will act as catalysts for constructive change and catalysts for peace during the remainder of the election season. They are a small uh, drop in the bucket of the young leaders across the continent, but each one can have impact on dozens of others. And we're hopeful that as we build the Yali network across Africa, that we will see the catalytic uh, impact of what these young people uh, can do. But they have to be given space, they have to be supported to be successful in their endeavors and to create opportunities for, for them. And we're all responsible for ensuring that they have the opportunities to be the leaders that we know that they are capable of being. In too many places across the globe, we see young people who are not vested in the futures of their country. They are attracted by extremist ideologies because they have no other ideology to focus on. This is what Yali has, uh, Yali is about. It's about investing in the next generation of Africans, and it's about us doing the most that we can do to mentor them and support them. It's about finding a way to provide opportunities for these young people so that they are not attracted to organizations like Boko Haram. Instead, they will be vested in the futures of their countries. And when young people can find jobs, when they can find successful businesses, when they get a good education that they can use and have a voice in their governance, they will shun extremism. They will participate in their country's future. They will make a difference. And as we help build the next generation uh, of Nigerians, uh, we recognize that events are moving swiftly right now. So we're talking about the next generation, but things are happening right now. They're happening tomorrow. Election season is already on the way. On June 21st, voters went to the polls in Ikiti, a uh, state in southwestern Nigeria, to choose between their incumbent gover government, or governor, and a host of challenges. We engaged strongly to help make Ikiti's election the best they could possibly be. Our embassy and our consulate filled 32 observers who visited over 180 polling stations in the state. And I made calls on June 20th to the leading candidates and to key electoral and security officials. I think some of them were wondering who the heck I was, uh, calling them when they were in, involved in the throes of the election. But the point was that they needed to know that this was being watched all over the world. This was not just about what was happening in Akiti State, but it was about how what was happening in Akiti State would be reviewed all over the world. Uh, the elections proceeded relatively peacefully, and when the results were made clear that Governor Fayemi, the incumbent government had lost, governor had lost, he graciously conceded. Overall, the security services performed admir admirably in, the in, uh, in ensuring that uh, the, the safety of the voters, and I INEC administered what uh, was considered a credible election. Yet we are concerned by reports that the military restricted the movements of leading opposition politicians from outside Ikiti. When voters go to the polls in Osun State on August 9th, the world will be watching again uh, closely to see whether the prerogatives of all parties, parties and all voters are respected. And I'm hopeful that this election will turn out uh, even better than the Akiti election because we will, will have had the experience of Akiti, learn from any mistakes that were made and ensure that it's a better process. The elections in Akiti and Osun are the last off-cycle elections before the national and state elections that take place in February. As of today, we are a mere seven months 
uh, until the national vote. And again, the world would be watching Nigeria as it makes its final preparations. Events like what we're doing here today at CSIS contribute to the tough but fruitful conversations that Nigerians are having about their future. Just as we benefited from hearing from uh, this panel and experts today, it is my hope that our distinguished guests will leave here with renewed enthusiasm for the vital work of securing Nigeria's democracy, the largest democracy on the continent of Africa and one of the largest in the world. As ever, the United States will work hard to aid that effort and to support those efforts. In less than a month, as you heard earlier, President Obama will host leaders from across Africa, including from Nigeria, for the historic U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit. This is the first time we've had a summit like this in Washington, and certainly the themes that we have discussed here would be part of the conversations as we collectively look at governing for the future and what that means on the continent of Africa. We've been consulting closely with our African partners to ensure that this is a successful and a transformational event. The President and Sec Secretary Kerry are looking forward to the summit, as you can uh, well uh, expect that I am as well. Let me thank all of you very much for your attention, for sharing your wisdom with us today at this conference. And again, I wanna thank CS CSIS for hosting uh, this event. I'll look forward to taking some questions from you. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll uh, take a group of questions and, and then we'll uh, let Secretary Thomas Greenfield respond. Yeah, we're here. Ambassador, you get to ask questions all the time. No. <laughs> and it I is see a, you it every is, day. It is a question. My dear sister, I'm going to disappoint you. Yeah. This time I, <laughs> Thank I, you. I'm not going to ask a question. I think I had enough answering questions last Thursday at the Hill. It was a thorough three-hour grilling, so I'm not, I'm, I'm not inclined to have that. I just want to say, on behalf of the government of Nigeria, how grateful we are to the U.S. government and to you personally for the interest you have taken in Nigeria, particularly in these forthcoming elections. In 2011, the U.S. government, through several agencies, supported INEC and other agencies towards the organization of the most successful election ever in Nigeria. And um, you've always given support to INEC and other agencies to ensure that the, the experience of 2011 is not, only, is not only repeated, but also improved upon. Just about two, three months ago, you were in Nigeria. We had a meeting of the U.S.-Nigeria Binational Commission. That is the commission through which there are four components of that, of, of that commission. One of them is focused on transparency, governance, and integrity. It is through that component that the U.S. contributes and assists Nigeria in organizing a successful election. We met last in, in Abuja. Next meeting is being planned. I'm still discussing with my boss here, uh, the head of the Nigerian office, and that's another thing, is uh, we, the, the U.S. government has decided to create a separate office Taking us out of, out of West Africa, we are too much for the rest of West Africa. They've taken us out of West Africa and created a specific office to deal with Nigeria. That shows the strategic importance which the U.S. attaches to Nigeria. And for that, we are very grateful. So we, I just want to assure you that uh, on behalf of the Nigerian government, we appreciate what your government is doing. We appreciate what you personally are doing. Because we, we call her Omowale. The child has come back home. She has served in Nigeria, and she's, so, she's been in Nigeria so many times that other ambassadors from African countries are asking, why is Linda always going to Nigeria? You can't, take, you can't compare Nigeria with most of these other African countries. <laughs> anyway, so, <laughs> so, so we, we are very grateful. I just want to assure you that we know the importance of the elections to, to Nigeria. We know what elections means to uh, America's urge to see a very peaceful, peaceful world. And we know what, it, more importantly, we know what it means to us. We are determined to make it a success because we know the security of our country depends on it. And I want to assure you that in spite of what is happening, in spite of 10,000 Boko Haram, we are going to make the 2015 elections a success. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah, over here, please. Hi, I'm Brenda Humphrey, and I'm a former Ford Fellow in city planning, and I lived and worked in Liberia as a, of course, city planner. I'm wondering if there are any instructive parallels from the elections in Liberia that you would share with us that might apply to, to Nigeria. Okay, thank you. Okay, you sure. want to take a few? Yeah, I'm going to okay. take a few and then maybe a couple more. Thank you, good afternoon. Uh, let me also join others to thank, you know, um, Her Excellency for this wonderful presentation and for the interest and passion that she has on Nigeria. Uh, I met her, I think, when she was in Abuja in one of those trips, you know, at the ambassador house. Um, I just want to ask, you know, specifically on the uh, Obama meeting with African leaders. I know when the concept, you know, was developed, the embassy circulated it to some people, and I was one of the people who commented, you know, I was asked to comment on the concept, but I'm not aware whether civil society are going to be part of that process, because so far I have not had any Nigerian civil society being uh, invited to be part of this very historic, you know, uh, meeting. So I want to know whether there's any plan, although it's getting late, you know, whether there's going to be any civil society from Nigeria that will be part of that process. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Did see one over here? Back there? Yeah. Yes. Um, my name is Andrew Chomomo, and I'm an attorney. I practice here. Both Nigerian Constitution and the U.S. Immigration and Naturalization Act permit dual citizenship, mm -hmm. which means that millions of Nigerians in America can vote. Now, question for you is, is there anything the United States can do to help Nigeria actualize the diaspora votes for Nigeria? Okay. Mm -hmm. And I think we've got room for one more. Right back there, sorry. Uh, thank you. My name is Sally Booker, um, Madam Secretary. Uh, this question is apropos of security cooperation with Nigeria. Current U.S. laws, specifically the Leahy laws, restrict the U.S. government's ability to provide uh, military or security training and cooperation with individuals or units um, who there is a credible evidence that they've been engaged in gross violations of human rights. Now. Uh, currently, this restriction renders ineligible maybe one-fifth of Nigeria's uh, security forces from training and cooperation uh, with the U.S. Uh, military and, and State Department. President Obama has uh, announced his intention to seek uh, to circumvent this law through a waiver in his request for the $5 billion uh, terrorism, counterterrorism uh, partnership uh, fund that he's requesting of Congress. My question is simply, what's the rationale for seeking that kind of waiver? And particularly in the case of Nigeria, where the United States really wants to improve the human rights uh, performance of the Nigerian security forces. OK, I think I have enough uh, uh, to keep me going for a while. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Adifuye, for, uh, for your comments. Again, we are uh, working uh, very, very uh, uh, closely with the government and uh, civil society, security services, and others to ensure that the elections are, are free, fair, and, uh, and peaceful. And uh, I very much uh, appreciate the uh, dialogue that we had with the Nigerian government back in February that looked at uh, all of these areas uh, across the board. Um, on uh, Liberia, uh, where we were successful in uh, achieving uh, very good uh, election results, both in 2006 and in uh, 2011, I think there are, are some lessons to, to be learned. I think there was a strong commitment on the part of the government for the elections to go well, and as well uh, on the part of, uh, on the, part of uh, the opposition. Uh, we held a lot of meetings uh, with, uh, with the opposition and with the government uh, to, uh, uh, in the lead up to, to the election. What was different about uh, uh, Liberia uh, that won't be the case in Liberia is that there was uh, it, 
there was uh, the international community, uh, a huge peacekeeping force there to help uh, to ensure uh, security and peace during, during the election. Uh, that was a bit unusual. Uh, but also, I think uh, civil society played a huge part in making sure that people were educated uh, and prepared and understood the, the process of, of voting. And again, these are all lessons that uh, we, we can learn. And thank you for, the, for that question, because we did have successful elections. On civil society participation in the head, heads of state uh, summit, uh, there is uh, a variety of opportunities for civil society to participate. On the 4th of August, there is a large civil society event uh, that will be hosted by the Secretary of State at the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, and he will be holding a town hall meeting where they will be taking uh, 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 questions uh, online and, and Twitter as well. But there are 30 plus side events around Washington, uh, including uh, events that are being hosted by the Congress uh, that uh, will have intense civil society uh, involvement. Uh, I don't know who has been invited to all of uh, these various events, but I do know that there are quite a few, uh, and there should be opportunities for participation across the board uh, by civil society. Uh, I'm not sure on dual citizens. I think I'm going to throw that question at the ambassador, uh, because uh, I've known in other cases where uh, countries do uh, allow for dual citizens to vote, uh, the votes usually take place at the embassies, uh, and uh, that's what we do in, in, uh, in the uh, United States, and I would encourage uh, Ambassador Adifuye uh, and the Nigerian government to look for possibilities of allowing votes at the embassies or at the numerous consulates that, are, uh, that exist across uh, the United States for those Nigerian citizens who are, uh, who are registered to vote. I support the idea of dual citizens being allowed to uh, participate in, in the election. And again, it's not something that we, we can do, but we certainly support, uh, support those efforts. On, uh, on Leahy, the Department of State strongly supports Leahy. Uh, it is part of our programs that uh, allow us to uh, provide assistance to, uh, to the uh, governments that we work with across the board those that are involved, that we have credible evidence of their involvement in, uh, uh, in human rights violations or, or other uh, gross acts against uh, civilians are not part of our program. Uh, I can't uh, comment on, I, I think the law you're, you're referring to uh, provides some opportunities for our colleagues in DOD uh, to uh, uh, continue to support uh, some groups, but I think in the final analysis, uh, there's no question that we don't want to support anyone uh, who might use the, um, the training or equipment that we provided to them to commit acts of, uh, of uh, human rights uh, violations against, uh, against citizens. So there is no effort on our part to circumvent uh, Leahy. We have embraced Leahy, uh, and we are trying to ensure that uh, the implementation of Leahy, Leahy occurs uh, uh, in a way that respects uh, human rights. So again, this is not a, this is not an effort to get around uh, to, or circumvent the law. Again, let me thank all of you uh, again for all of your efforts here. Uh, this is going to be a huge contribution uh, to Nigeria's electoral process. Uh, your efforts, your work, uh, whether you're working in civil society or you're working in government or your advocacy groups in the United States will make a huge difference on how successful this election is. So again, I encourage you and support your efforts. And uh, I'll look forward to congratulating Nigeria in February of 2015 uh, for a successful, peaceful, transparent uh, election that reflects the will of the people of Nigeria. Thank you very much. <laughs>